Turn your attention to Isaiah chapter 43, verse 16 through 19, reading from the New Living Translation. Notice here the word of the Lord. I am the Lord who opened a way through the waters, making a dry path through the sea. I call forth the mighty army of Egypt with all its chariots and horses, and I drew them beneath the waves and they drowned. Their lives snuffed out like a smoldering candle wick. But forget all that. It is nothing compared to what I am going to do. For I'm about to do something new. See, I have already begun. Do you not see it? I will make a pathway through the wilderness. I will create rivers in the dry wasteland. I'm speaking today from the subject simply, focus forward. Focus forward. God began this by sharing with Israel here that I've done great things in the past. And he was just refreshing their mind about one of the most outstanding and notable miracles that God did in all of the Old Testament, which was the parting of the Red Sea and allowing the children of Israel to go across on dry land. And then he called Pharaoh's army to go through and then he closed the waters and drowned them. It reminds us that you can't ride in off of somebody else's miracle. That what's for you when God is your father and God has given you something, it's for you. And other folks, when they try to ride in on what God has reserved for you, things tend to close in and go over their head. They try to do something that God has given you a grace to do. And so God was saying, remember when I did that. Nobody had ever seen the waters parted on the left and the right hand. And then the children of Israel, you're talking about God leading conservatively about 1.2 or 3 million people, maybe, maybe 2 to 3 million people through this Red Sea experience. And then he closed the sea over them. So God was saying, you thought that was something. He was like, you've not seen anything yet. He says, I'm getting ready to do some stuff now that you've never seen that's getting ready to defy the natural order of things. He says, I'm going to make rivers go through the desert in places where you shouldn't prosper. I'm going to make you prosper. Where you shouldn't be able to do this because of your age, I'm going to renew your strength. Where you shouldn't have any energy, I'm going to give you energy. I'm going to do unusual things in strange places. You'll be in a section of town and say, say why are you going all over there, way out there? And God says, I'll prosper you in a place where nobody is yet. In a desert place, I'm going to cause you to grow. I'll bless your business right where you are. God says, I'm getting ready to do something brand new. Focus forward. Focus forward. He says, I've done some great things back there, but it's nothing compared to what I'm getting ready to do. God is in the process. He says, I've already begun it. I've already begun the process. This is not something that I'm going to do. He says, I've already begun it. He says, don't you see it? Don't you see it? Are you looking with expectations? Can you see it? And how often do we find people who are still stumbling over stuff that is behind them? If you are stumbling over what's behind you, you're walking in the wrong direction. That's why the message is entitled, Focus Forward. Focus Forward. Focus Forward. you know why? Because God intends for us to focus forward. God intends for us to focus forward. The journey is so much easier when you are not carrying your past. He says, look ahead, look ahead at what, what, what I've got for you in your future. I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. I know what's in your future. Plans to give you a hope and a future. He says, focus forward, focus forward, focus forward. He reminds us in, in Psalm 119 verse 105 that your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Well, you know, the way that your feet are designed is they're designed to walk forward, to move you forward step by step. And so he says, my word is a lamp to your feet and a light to your pathway. I'm going to give you enough light to be able to see how to take the next step. You don't have to know everything. All you need to do is to be able to see the next step and the next step. Have you ever been in a dense fog? You can't see very far down the road. But you can see enough to be able to take the next step. 
when you're in a fog. And it, it's clear right where you are immediately, but you can't see that far. Your visibility is very limited. And God says, my word is going to be like that so that you trust me and that you never get to a place in life that you think that you don't need me anymore. He said, I want you to depend on me just like you depend on your food. So that you don't ever think that you've got it all figured out. He says, I want you to be able to trust me. So that's why God will plan in your life some surprise moves that you didn't see coming. So that it throws your equilibrium off and now you got to trust me for your next step. But he's saying, focus forward. I'm going to give you light for your next step. I'm going to give you light for your next step. You don't have to be able to see the whole staircase. All you need to do is to see the next step. Take that step, and then when it's time to take the next step, God will give you light for that step. Focus forward, focus forward, focus forward. Then I want you to see here in, in Deuteronomy, where at, uh, in Numbers, actually, number 8 and verse 1 through 3. Notice here, the Lord said to Moses, give Aaron the following instruction. When you set up the seven lamps, because he said my word is like a lamp. Uh, the seven lamps in the lampstand, place them so that their light shines which way? forward forward in front of the lampstand he said place the lamps so that the light shines forward because you are to focus forward it, the, the light is not to shine back it's to shine forward so you can see where you're going not merely where you've come from he says I want to show you something because what's in front of you is greater than where you've come from and he said so Aaron did this and he set up the seven lamps so that they reflected their light forward, just as the Lord commanded Moses. God wants your, your focus to be on what's forward. The light from the lamps there was set to be able to shine forward. So you'll see your next step. The light shines on where you're going. God will give you light. You walk in the light that you have. Until you get another word from God, walk in the current light that you have. In other words, do what you know that you ought to do right now. Even if you don't know everything that you need to do in the future, do what you know to do is right right now. Sometimes victory is not about uh, winning some great reward down the road. It is being faithful in the currency of the day in what's happening in your life right now of what I can see right now and what God has given me light to be able to see I'm going to walk in the light that I have because your feet are designed to walk forward not backward that your toes are fa fa facing the direction that you ought to go that's why you face forward face forward forward march there's a command forward march forward march and so you have to be able to keep looking forward uh, you know, I, I don't uh, ascribe to everything that, that, that Gordon Ramsay does, but he said something that I thought that was noteworthy. Take a look at this little meme here. He says, I don't like looking back. I'm always constantly looking forward. I'm not the one to sort of sit and cry over spilt milk. I'm too busy looking for the next cow. I mean, what's gone is gone. If you've got spilled milk in your life, if you've gone through a divorce, if you dealt with failure and financial ruin and if you've lost money in a bad deal and sometimes the bad deal was lending to somebody that you thought you could trust who was going to pay you your money back and you don't see your money anymore. Yeah, money talks is always saying bye-bye. <laughs> but he says, listen, I'm looking. I'm not, not going to cry over spilled milk. I'm going to look for my next cow. It's time for you to start looking for your next cow. To face forward and look for your next cow. Look for the thing that's going to feed you in the season of where God is bringing you in your life. And so this is why you've got to face forward. You know why? Because direction is more important than speed. you got to have your direction. What good is it to have speed if you don't know where you're going? you got to know the direction. Direction is more important than speed. Direction is much more important than speed. And some people just want to do something quick, quick, quick. They're so impatient. they got ADD. They want to do everything quickly, quick, quick, quick. But take your time. Take your time. Take your time. Take your time and stay focused. Focus forward. Take a look at this little video clip about the tortoise and the hare. This is a real life experience. <laughs> The hair is in the lead. The slow and steady. Focus. Focus forward. Look at the rabbit.
have it, looking at everything that's happening. Focus is broken. Can't even stay in his own lane, concerned about what somebody else is doing. And look who's crossing the finish line. There you have it, Mr. Tortoise wins the race. Sometimes the slower you go, the faster you learn. The slower you go, the faster you learn. Whenever you're trying to teach somebody something, slow it down. Slow it down. You don't learn at, at tempo. You have to slow it down. If you're learning music, you have to slow it down. If you're learning how to play an instrument, slow it down. You can't play at tempo when you first pick up a music piece. You have to slow it down measure by measure. Before you can learn to even play the page, you got to go measure by measure, and, and you have to slow it way down. The slower you go, the faster you learn. When you take your time and, and learn something slowly, it stays with you longer. It stays with you longer. I mentioned that we, we had a, one of our teachers in elementary school. Her, her, her name was Sylvia Sewell. She's been here to this church, and she was an outstanding teacher. Uh, she made the class every week learn a new poem. Every week, we had to learn a poem. I, you know, I learned be strong. We are not here to, to struggle. We've got loads to lift. And, and yet all of these poems that just came, just, just poem after poem, week after week. And when I knew that I was going to have to recite my poem, I started a week in advance. But my brother Darrell, oh, he didn't start until the night before. The night before, he'd be in there cramming, cramming. And somehow, on the next day, he'd get up in the morning, cramming again, cramming again. And, and, he, and he could stumble through and, and go ahead and get his grade. And, uh, but you know, by, by that Friday, what he had memorized earlier in the week to be able to recite was gone. And, and, and I, who spent a week getting mine in me, mine stayed. And so, so many of those poems that I learned, I remember I learned one called The Wind. Why does the wind so want to be here in my little room with me? It's all the world to blow about, but just because I keep it out. And I'm just one thing after another. And so many of those poems, they come back to me at various times, but I took the time. I learned it slow. I learned it slow. The fastest way to learn is to learn slow. I, I, I can't learn something and you're just running through it so, so rapidly. I couldn't learn how to tie a necktie trying to do it so fast. Slow it down. When I'm learning something on YouTube, I have to wind it back. I have to slow it down. <laughs> because the slower you learn, the faster you actually learn. Sometimes the slower you go, the faster you learn. And see, the way that your brain is created, your brain is designed to create reality based on whatever you pay attention to. Your brain creates reality based on whatever you pay attention to. And that's why if you've ever gone and used any of those virtual reality kind of headsets, the goggles, and you put it on, and it's, it's, it's just a spectacle to watch somebody with virtual reality goggles on because they're doing things with their body, look at all crazy, because to them, their mind says, this is your reality. You're going down the hill. You're going up the hill. You're, this is happening to you. It's telling them this is your reality. So all of their body functions, their heart rate, their breathing, all of this, the, the, the same reactions are happening in virtual reality that would happen in the real world. Because your brain creates its reality based on whatever you pay attention to and focus on. So whenever you learn to manage and direct your focus, you can improve virtually every aspect of your life by simply learning to manage and direct your focus. You can improve virtually every aspect of your life. You know why? Because where focus goes, energy flows. Where focus goes, energy flows. That's the way that it works. And I want you to understand this principle, that the success of your life is determined not by what you've lost, but by what you have left. The real success of your life is determined not by what you've lost, but by what you have left. Whatever God is going to do in your future, it will never be at the requisition of something that you've already lost. God will never ask you to build a future based on money that you've lost, based on people that you've lost 
based on energy that you've lost. Whenever God is going to build something in your future, it's always based on whatever you have left now. Whatever God's command to you to do in your future, it is always based on what you have, not what you had. So you do it off of what you've got right now. And that's where you put your focus. Just think about it. If, if you're flying in a twin engine jet plane, and all of a sudden, the left engine goes out. Where do you think the pilot's focus goes on? The left engine that has gone out? Or is he looking at the right engine that's still working? See, because he's like, I got to have the power from this right jet over here in order to help me to land this plane safely. So he's looking, and his whole faith is in being able to be carried so that this one engine on the right side can help me to land this plane. There's no looking. No need in looking on the side that has died, that has gone off. Focus on the one that's providing the energy, the thing that's giving you the force to be able to bring the thing in. Yes, something happened, but now my faith, everything that we are, we are riding on right now is happening on this one jet, and that's where the pilot, he's keeping an eye on this jet over here, the one that is surviving, the one that is still producing, the one that he has, not the one that he has lost. And here's the principle. Faith follows focus. Faith follows focus. Faith follows focus. Whatever you focus on is what you'll have faith in. If you start focusing on the statistics, you'll have faith in the statistics and they will produce anxiety in you. Whatever you focus on, faith follows focus. Say that with me. Faith follows focus. Say it again. Faith follows focus. Say it once again. Faith follows focus. Faith follows focus. Focus. Whatever you focus on, whatever you focus on is where your faith will develop. Faith follows focus. You know, every day, one of the things that I do, I said, I'm getting better and better. I'm getting better and better. It's better than deteriorating. It's better than being worse. Who wants on the next day to feel like you're going in the wrong direction? If you got a bad day to today, at least when you wake up tomorrow, I'm getting better and better. If you just had surgery yesterday and you're sore and you're uncomfortable and you're dealing with the side effects of surgery and medications and all of that, at least tomorrow I'm, I'm, I'm getting better and better. I'm getting better and better. I'm getting better and better. Every day is a better day. Every day is a better day. I'm getting better and better. Because faith follows focus. If you're focusing on getting better, if you're focused on going up, if you're focusing on producing more, guess what? Faith follows focus. Faith follows focus. Faith follows focus. And that's why you have to guard your focus with tenacity. Guard your focus. Romans 10, 17 has told us, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. If you will give focus to the Word, faith will come. Because faith is in the word. And so when you, the more of it you hear, the more attention that you give to it, the more faith builds in you. Uh, that's not just a new thing. That's something that was even back in the Old Testament. And this is why they uh, admonished us to guard the focus of your attention. Notice Proverbs chapter 4 verse 22, 27. Notice. He's saying these words on purpose. My child, pay attention to what I say. Listen carefully to my words. Because faith follows focus. Faith follows focus. Guard your focus. Pay attention to what I say. Listen to, carefully to my words. This is God speaking. Saying, pay attention to my words, to what I speak to you. Listen carefully to my words. Don't lose sight of them. Let them penetrate deep into your hearts. For they bring life to those who find them and healing to their whole body. There's life in the word. There's life in the word. Life in the word. Healing in the word. The Bible says in the original Hebrew, it says the words of God are like medicine to our flesh. Medicine to your whole body. So he says in verse 23, guard your heart above all else for it determines the course of your life. Avoid all perverse talk and stay away from corrupt speech, negative speech, gossip, backbiting, putting, uh, attacking someone else's character. He says, don't get involved in that because faith follows focus. And if you focus on somebody else's flaws, it'll magnify yours. Faith follows focus. Faith follows focus. He says, avoid all perverse talk, all this crazy negative stuff that's 
tearing somebody else down. He said, avoid that. Stay away from corrupt speech because if you go that way, so will you go. Your faith is going to follow your mouth. That's why he says, speak these words. Speak these words. Focus on what I say to you. And then he says, verse 25, look straight ahead and fix your eyes on what lies before you. Focus forward. And then he says, mark out a straight path for your feet and stay on the safe path. Don't get sidetracked. Keep your feet from following evil. In other words, focus forward. Focus forward. Focus forward. Don't get distracted. Guard your focus. Guard your focus. There's so much in our culture that is fighting for your attention, fighting for your eyeballs. They are fighting for your attention because they want to sell you something. They want to market something to you. They want to influence your attitudes and your belief system. They want to influence you. And so they are fighting. They're fighting. Marketing and branding is about fighting for your attention to be able to influence your decisions. And just remember this, that whatever or whoever obtains and maintains your focus will ultimately change your life. Whatever or whoever obtains and maintains your focus will ultimately change your life. If you fix your eye on a certain woman, you fix your eye on a certain man, they're going to change your life. I mean, good or bad, whatever obtains your focus and maintains it, whatever or whoever obtains it and maintains it, it's going to ultimately change your life. If you, if you get fixated on pornography, it'll change your life. It'll change your life. If you get fixated on drugs, it'll change your life. Whatever you, uh, whatever or whoever obtains and maintains your focus will ultimately change your life. That's why you have to guard your focus. And that's why when God really wants to get your attention, sometimes he sends pain into your life. Because pain gets our attention, not to hurt us, but so that you can fix what's wrong. The only way that you'll know that something is wrong is because you'll experience pain. Whenever you neglect doing what you need to do in your marriage, you'll have pain in your marriage. The pain is there to let you know something is wrong here and you need to focus your attention on it so that you can fix what's wrong. Remember that the word focus, say focus. It literally means, it comes from an old, old word that simply means fireplace. And whenever you lose your focus, you lose your fire. So when you find the person who has lost their passion for whatever it is that they do in life, it's because they've lost their focus. They've lost their focus because remember, faith follows focus. And if you get your mind thrown off of your focus, you will lose your fire. You lose your passion. The focus is a fireplace. It used to be the central place in, in, a, in a home. I mean, sometimes when nothing else was standing of an old home, a chimney with a fireplace, in it, uh, you, you know, uh, used to be, is still standing. Anybody ever drive by and see a house and just see old chimney, old brick chimney that's still there, a stone chimney that's still there? It was the central place of the house. That was the family room. That was really essentially the house. Back in the day, you didn't even have a, a, a bathroom indoors with any indoor plumbing. You had to go to an outhouse. Anybody here old enough to remember an outhouse? I didn't say you had to use it every time, but you, were here, you, you remember an outhouse. You didn't have indoor plumbing. Wouldn't that be a mess to have diarrhea in the wintertime and have to go out to the outhouse? What kind of evil torment is that? I mean, what are you going to do? You can't use a slop jar for that. How many of y'all know what a slop jar is? Oh, some people know what a slop jar. Oh, if, you, if you're too young, Google it. <laughs> I'm not sure that Google knows. It's amazing. It's amazing. But just remember that instead of just letting your goals be something that's an annual thing that you just throw out there, I want to encourage you to focus on an action for today that will move you a little closer to what you desire. Because you can have all kind of goals that you want, but if your goals are not supported by an action that moves you closer to that goal or desire, you're wasting your time. It's easy to write goals, it's not easy to write actions. So when you write your goal, you need to have a corresponding column to say what action will I do that will move me closer to this goal. Don't just write a goal. If your goal is to lose weight, what's your action? If your action is not reflected in what you put in your body and the exercise that you do, you're wasting your time and fooling yourself. 
If you've got a goal, you can't just name it and cram it and blab it and grab it. You've got to have an action that you do today, today, today at your mealtime. You've got to be able to govern what you uh, put into your mouth and go for the baked instead of the fried. You've got, you got to govern it. You've got to govern it because, you see, remember again, your, your focus is going to determine your outcome. Whatever you focus on is where your faith will come. And so you'll see your faith and your works working together when there's a corresponding action today that moves you closer to the fulfilling of that. I love something that Matthias Alexander said when he said that people do not decide their futures. They decide their habits and their habits decide their futures. It's your habit that will decide your future. If somebody's got a drug habit, it decides their future. If somebody has an alcohol ha habit, it decides their future. If somebody has a sexual addiction, that habit will decide their future. Your habits decide your future. Whatever obsessions that you have, your habits decide your future. Habits decide your future. Because whatever you repeat, you reinforce. You reinforce in your life. You reinforce in your life and so I encourage you today walk in the present as the person that you want to be in the future walk in the present as the person that you want to be in the future you know why because you can only become tomorrow who you are becoming today you can only become tomorrow who you're becoming today so you have to face forward face forward look to where you're going not where you came from look to where you're going look to where you're going I love it how uh, the Apostle Paul writing to the church at Philippi wrote to them in, Philippi, uh, in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 12 through 14. Notice this. He says, I don't mean to say that I have already achieved these things or that I've already reached perfection, but I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. No, dear brothers and sisters, I've not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing. I focus because faith follows focus. I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. So I want you to notice here, he says, I'm focused forward. I, I choose to forget what's behind and I'm reaching forward. I'm pressing, 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 pushing here. I'm pushing so that I can get to what's in my future. See, there, there, there are a couple of things that you have to think about. You have to think of a pull and a push. A pull and a push. Whatever you've come from in your past, you have to push that back. And it's hard to push that back if you don't have anything that is pulling you, an attraction to something that's before you. See, the best way to get over an old flame that you know you were so head over heels about, the best way to get over an old flame is to find a new flame that's got more going on than the old flame. And if you get somebody that is better in your future than the thing that brought abuse to you and frustration to you and aggravation and distrust and philandering in the past, if you got something that is, looks better to you in your future, it's easy for that to be your draw. So you gotta have something that pulls you and you got to be repulsed by the bad stuff that happened in your past that I don't ever want to go back to that and never again will I allow somebody to talk to me in this way and to de degrade me and to destroy myself. Never. That should repel you. The push repels, the pull attracts. So you need both a push and a pull. A push and a pull. And so Paul said, I forget those things which are behind and then I press, I press, I press. You have to have a push and a pull. There has to be something in front of you that is greater than the past that was behind you that pulls you, that draws you, that says greater is waiting for you, that greater, 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 greater. I came to talk to people that have something that they are working on right now. Uh, you may not be there yet, but, but you ought to be able to say to yourself, I'm working on something. I'm working on something. I'm on this job right now. It's not the ideal thing. It's paying my bills for now. It's putting me through school for now. But I'm working on something. I am working on something. Sometimes you have to work in places that are not your dream. It's not your ideal. It's not there yet, but I'm working on something. I am working on something. I'm talking to somebody that's got something in their belly that is pulling them that wakes you up in the middle of the night something that will say hey 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 
It's 3.15 in the morning. Get up. Think about me. I'm talking to somebody that has a pull in them. Nobody has to drag you out of bed. Your dream pulls you. It, it, it has something on the inside of you. And it's just saying, get up, get up, get up, get up. Think about me. Get your pen out. Get your computer out. We're getting ready to talk right now. We're getting ready to have cl a class right now. We're going to dream. I'm talking to somebody that has a baby on the inside of them that is leaping and kicking you. And you really can't sleep because it's pulling you even when you don't feel like going. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Tell somebody. Tell them I'm working on something. I'm working on something. I am working on something. I'm working on something. I'm working on something. I'm working on it. But you got to have a push and a pull. 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 It's not that you're just getting rid of something. You can't have a void in you. Every void is going to be filled with something. And when I push this out, I've got to have something that fills the space. I've got to have something that pulls me, attracts me, draws me into it. You have to be drawn into your destiny. I want you to think of this thing like a door. There are some doors that you open by pushing them. There are other doors that you open by pulling. And you got to know whether you need to push or pull. And it depends on whether you are entered into the next level of where you're trying to go. Some of them you have to push to open the door to get out. Others you have to pull in order to get in. It depends on the door. And some doors are sliding doors that you have to pull open and push close. It depends on how you look at it. You could pull it open and push it close or vice versa. But there are different kinds of doors and the next dimension of where you're trying to get into your life is like a door. And you've got to understand the pull and the push of things. And if you do the wrong thing with the door, you'll be going up to a door that clearly says pull and you're trying to push it. And it is though it is locked. It's not locked. You're just doing the wrong thing at the wrong time. And you got to know when to pull and you got to know when to push if you're going to be allowed entrance into that place. And then it's tricky, it's tricky, it's tricky with doors because Jesus said, I am the door. And there are some doors that you can't get into unless somebody who has a security clearance will use their security card to open the door for you. The other doors you have to punch in key codes to in order to enter. And you can push and pull all you want, but until you have put the code in. And that's why your mouth has got to be lined up before you just go and start pushing and pulling on doors. That's why you got to pray first. That's why you got to have something that you're pushing and pulling. And you got to know and you got to be able to follow the Holy Ghost. To say, Lord, I need to know what I need to do in this situation in my life. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I'm just talking about this next dimension, these seasons of favor that God is opening for you. Because you can't force yourself in it. It is what God is saying. I want you to focus forward. Focus forward. I know some things have been great back there, but God says, I'm, behold, I'm doing a new thing. I'm doing a new thing. Shall you not see it? He says, it's springing forth now. He says, I'm already establishing this thing. But this thing has to be like the largeness of a windshield in your automobile. It's a windshield. It's the difference between the windshield and the rear view mirror. It tells you how much time that you spend with each one. The windshield is real big. Most of your focus should be given toward what's in front of you, where you're going, and you only periodically glance back through the rearview mirror. So it's, it's a glancing and a gazing, a glance and a gaze, a glance and a gaze. When you are running a race with somebody, and you're in your lane, and somebody else is coming up beside you, you, you need to have a gaze where you're looking at where you're going to stay in your lane. But then you have to glance over and see where the competition is. You have to see where the enemy is just with a glance. You can't, you can't run your race like this. Stay in your lane. Keep your focus. Keep your focus. That was the problem with the, with the rabbit. The rabbit just turned completely. He's over looking at, in somebody else's lane. And he misses it because he can't have it. His focus is diverted. He's gazing in the wrong area. You gaze out here and you glance here. You gaze, glance. The big windshield 
is for you to gaze out of the, the windshield to see what's ahead of you. Always look straight ahead. You look straight ahead. You say, God, I want to go to what you've got ahead for me. And then you just glance at what's behind and say, Lord, I thank you for all of my teachers. I thank you for every mentor. I thank you for my parents that sat up with me and that paid for me to get to the place. Thank you, God, for those that came before me that paid the price to be able to lay the way. Thank you for them. You, 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 look, you glance and you thank him. You, 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 just, you just glance and you say, Lord, I thank you. Thank you. Thank you for my teachers. Thank you for those that were patient with me. Thank you for those that developed me. Thank you for those that trained me. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank Thank you. And, and when, as long as, and that's why you should never just look out of the windshield without ever glancing in the mirror. Because the mirror is designed to reflect and to respect, to look back and to say thank you for those that helped you. Even those that were pains in your side that taught you hard lessons because they still were teachers to you. And learning is a gift even when pain is the teacher. So even if pain is the teacher, Thank them. Thank you. And so you gaze, gaze out of the front window, out of the windshield. Glance in the mirror. Gaze, glance, gaze, glance. Gaze. You spend most of your time gazing out of what is ahead, what God has ahead for your life because God's bringing you into a good place. He's doing something that is exceptional and the future that God has for you when you walk with him in humility and honesty, it will blow your mind. In Hebrews chapter 12, notice verse 2 and 3 in the Message Bible. He says, do you see what this means? All these pioneers who blaze the way, all these veterans cheering us on, it means we better get on with it. Strip down, start running and never quit. No extra spiritual fat, no parasitic sins. Keep your eyes on Jesus, who both began and finished this race we're in. And study how he did it, because he never lost sight of where he was headed. He never lost sight of where he was headed because he was focused forward. He never lost sight of where he was headed, that exhilarating finish in and with God. He could put up with anything along the way. Why? Because he never lost sight of where he was headed. But he could put up with anything along the way. The cross, shame, whatever. And now he's there in that place of honor right alongside God. And when you find yourselves flagging in your faith, uh, go over that story again, item by item. That long litany of hostility he plowed through. That will shoot adrenaline into your soul. Just whenever, whenever you're having a problem, go back and think about what he did. But for the joy that was set before him. There was something that was set before him that he focused on. That's what gets you through. That's what gets a single mother through is the baby that is depending upon her. And she says, even though I don't feel like going right now. But I can't give up on them because I'm fighting for their future. This is not about me. This is about somebody else. Is there anybody here in this room? that didn't quit because somebody else was dependent on you. And you thought about other people that were depending on you and you said, you know what, I can't quit. I'd love to check out of here. But when you look at the future of somebody else that's depending on you and you realize I can't do this for the joy that is set, that allows you to plow through any and everything that could come your way because I got to finish. I've got to finish and you don't know what you can do until you got to do it. And that's why you have to find something in this life you have to find something that helps you to laugh through this life because life can be so painful that if you don't find something that becomes your medicine, the Bible says that a merry heart does good like a medicine and it is like a medicine in your soul. It's, it's a medicine. It, it, it helps us because not every day is a good day. And when you get angry because you've been cheated or betrayed by someone, and you've been hurt and offended by something, you have to use the medicine of laughter to help diffuse that and to anesthetize some of the pain that you're going through. It's, 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 a, it's a medicine. It does good like a medicine. It's, it's like windshield wipers, what they do for the automobile when you're driving in the rain. The wipers don't stop the rain, but the wipers make it where the rain doesn't stop you. Because if you didn't have wipers while your car is going through a downpour, it would obscure your vision to the degree that you'd have to pull over to the side and wait until it stopped raining. 
So the wipers don't stop the rain. They simply make it where the rain doesn't stop you. That's what laughter does for the human soul. It doesn't stop the rain. It doesn't stop the pain, but it makes it where the rain and the pain don't stop you. That's why you have to always have a nut in your life that makes you laugh. You need to keep somebody as your sidekick that has the ability to have access to your funny bone and let them help you to laugh during the time that you're going through the worst storm in your life. And it reminds me of the story of this old man that was struggling to try to take care of his family. This is back in the day when men took such great pride in providing for their families. And yet they were going through difficult economic times and he didn't have any food and he knew that everything in his house was hungry. And remember that God will not use what you've lost, but he'll use what you have left. And the old man looked around in his house and he realized, I don't have anything but that old shotgun. And he said, I got three shells. And he grabbed that old shotgun to go hunting after something. Because one thing that he knew is that there was no food in the house and there was no money. But he had to go out to try to get something to eat for his family. The old man got his old shotgun and those three shell bullets, put them in his pocket. Walking down the road, he took one of the bullets out and loaded it in his shotgun. And all of a sudden, he sees a rabbit, kapow, and he missed. And then he keeps on walking down the road. And there over behind the yard, he, he sees a squirrel, bullet number two. He loads the shell into the shotgun. Kapow! And he missed. And he knows three strikes and you're out. He's got one more bullet in his pocket. And he walks on down through some houses and comes in a wooded area. And he lands himself right in front of a tree. And he looks up that tree and discovers a wild turkey. And he hears a voice that says, pray, aim high, and focus. And while he's there looking at the turkey, all of a sudden he sees a deer that's a stone's throw away. And he's got a shotgun and one shell left in it. And he now takes the gun off of the deer off of the, the turkey and puts it on the deer. And while now he's got the gun on the deer, he hears the rattle of a rattlesnake in between his legs. And now the shotgun goes from the deer to the snake. And that voice said again, pray, aim high, focus and all of a sudden he resolved in his heart I'm going to obey that voice with a rattlesnake at his feet and he lifted the barrel of that shotgun up to the wild turkey and he said a prayer prayed out of his heart God I got one shell in this old gun and I need this to eat and I don't know how things are going to work out God but I trust you and he pulled the trigger, kapow! And that bullet came out with such force. It went through the turkey, killed the turkey, bounced off of that, hit the deer, killed the deer. And the handle, the butt of his, of his shotgun blasted off, hit the snake in the head, killed the snake. The blast from the shotgun blew him over into a pond. And now he stands up and realizes he's got fish in his pockets, a dead turkey, and a dead deer. Pray, aim high, focus. And I declare to you that if you just take some simple old-fashioned principles, pray, aim high, and focus if you'll obey God 
God will call a boomerang. He'll call a ricocheting of effects. And you'll hit this and God will have something to hit that. And God will put your name on the tongues of other people that you didn't even know. He'll put you on the minds of somebody. He'll let something on your social media come up on their page. He'll let a reference, a recommendation. He'll say, hey, there's a person that you need to meet that I met. He'll put them in the elevator with you. He'll put them in the grocery store line. He'll put them next to you in a restaurant. I declare to you, you may not know how you're going to get the target of whatever God has designed for you. But he has a way that if you'll pray and if you'll aim high and if you'll focus on God and what God has said to you, the enemy that is between your legs, and I hope you get it, there's always a devil trying to get in between your legs. My God, in the name of Jesus. If you'll trust him, if you'll pray and aim and focus. If you'll pray and aim and focus this year. If you'll just pray and aim and focus. My God, it does not yet appear what God will do in your life. There will be a domino effect of what will happen. All you have to do, and that's what happens when you take the first step toward obeying God. When you say, God, I don't know how I'm going to do this. I'm still dealing with challenges. I don't even know how I'm going to be feeling the next day. But Jesus, I'm still dealing with challenges. But God, I'm going after everything that I've got. I'm going to do it with everything that I've got. God knew when he called you and assigned you that you had a handicap. He knew when he told Harriet Tuckman to, to lead these folks to freedom on the Underground Railroad that she had these blackout spells. He knew that. And instead of healing her, he let her deliver even with the infirmity. And I don't know who I'm talking to in this place today, but you've got your infirmities and you know what your infirmity is. But God will not let your infirmity stop you. What God has, in, has called you to do, he's empowered you to do. He's equipped you to do. He's graced you to do. God has given you everything that you need if you'll follow his voice. If you'll follow his voice, if you'll pray, if you'll aim high, don't let your infirmities cause you to set limitations on yourself. If you ever let people create your world, they're created too small for you, tell you that you shouldn't be doing this, you're too old for this, this is too dangerous for you, and you've got too much at stake here, Listen, you go for broke, you go for broke, you got one bullet left. You got one bullet left and you need to pray because you need a domino effect of hitting one thing. And if you hit that one thing, if you ask God for the one right thing, it'll be a domino effect. If you'll ask for wisdom, he'll give you riches, he'll give you honor, he'll give you children, he'll give you favor. If you'll ask for the right thing, if you'll just know how to pray to get the mind of God, the discernment of the Holy Ghost will move on your behalf in an incredible way. And if you'll stay positive, because faith follows focus, and if you'll say, God, I only want to focus on what you're really calling me to do. I only want to focus on what you're really calling me to do. And God, I trust you. I trust you. I trust you. I trust you.